Hey people, Mark here, and welcome to another Halo ship breakdown. Today's video was going to be on the Valiant class, but I'm waiting on something, so we're doing a dropship today. And it is, and I want you to sit down for this one, it is my favorite Halo dropship of them all, and it's like, not close. What? F***ing what? I'll explain why at the end, but before we get there, two things have to happen. One, I've got to talk about the ship, you know, make, make the video. And two, you've got to subscribe. Honor system, don't watch further until you do that. And check out my smaller channel, Mark the Crawler, which is not dead. All right, now that you've done those things 100% for sure, we can begin. ASPCA Animal Charity, right above the related videos. Look at the dog, look at the sad dog, give him money. Sources are the Encyclopedia, the Halo 4 Essential Visual Guide, Warfleet, Halo 4, Halo Wars 2, Halo Shadows of Reach, and Halo Divine Wind. The Camiro Sish Pattern World Patroller, known to the UNSC as the Type 56 Deployment Platform Ground Support Slash Ultra Heavy, or more simply the Lich, is the largest dropship employed by the Covenant, Covenant Remnant, the Swords of Sanghelios, and the Banished. Even a couple rogue Sanghelios mercenary groups and Kigyar pirates make use of this thing because it's just very good. Measuring it at 102.8 meters long, the Lich is the sole occupant of the World Patroller class of vessels. The manufacturer of the Lich is Akom Weapons, a manufacturer based out of the continent Tolvus on Sanghelios. Akom is also responsible for the Type 44 and Type 57 Phantom seen here, as well as some patterns of Shade Turret and the little-known Calgiric pattern Tarask. The Lich is a big boy. 102.8 meters puts it at a third of the length of the CRS class cruiser and a tenth of the length of the CAR class frigate, which is crazy because this thing is a science fiction dropship. Usually these things are restricted to being 40 meters or less, but they were like, nah, we need to stuff an entire battalion in here. The largest UNSC drop ships are Condors, both the D-80 and D-81 LRT Condors, and their variants, all of which are 42.8 meters or 140 feet, a bit under half as long as the Lich. The Lich mass deployment platform was rare to see during the Human Covenant War, mainly being used for civilian transport and security work. So we can tack them onto that merchant fleet that we created in the CRS class cruiser video. Click up in the top right if you want to see that. Not counting the pilot and weapons officer, these things can carry up to 40 troops, which is almost double most phantoms. Like a phantom or a spirit, I assume the troops simply stand until they're dropped wherever they're going. The Lich has two large bay doors and a large gravity lift on its underside so it can deploy troops on any terrain without having to land, but also not forcing them to just jump out and wreak havoc on their knees. Seriously, I know the Sanghili and Kigyar's legs are kind of built for it, but the poor grunts. The Lich is also the most heavily armored dropship, with thick nano-laminate plating covering it from front to back in a sweeping motion like it was liquid poured over a ship and hardened. In line with the Covenant's biological and nautical motif, it looks just like a horseshoe crab. And with the way the armor is shaped, unless the Lich is hit directly in the underbelly, the curvature should direct a lot of the energy away from the core of the ship. This is more incentive for the thing to get as low to the ground as possible, lest it take something like an Onager or a Mammoth's Mini Mac directly to the grav lift and in turn straight into the inhabited portions. None of that's even mentioning the fact that the Lich is itself shielded. In any case, the Lich shouldn't be spending too much time down near the surface anyway. Once its fuck ton of troops are unloaded, it should make like a phantom and leave before or you can blow it up. Back to the ship that brought it. Speaking of which, the Lich has no slip space drive, and as such, it is not capable of interstellar travel on its own. This is no surprise, as it is much smaller than any of the ships we know to have them, with some notable exceptions that are very much outliers. Tart Cart was a modified Pelican given a slip space drive by a Hiragak, and the Ace of Spades is a civilian freighter, also heavily modified, that I did a video on. That one's been modified by two Forerunner AIs and is probably the fastest ship in the galaxy. But alas, the Lich is no such exception, having only an impulse drive to their name. This is the same drive that allows Seraphs, Phantoms, and Space Banshees to simply blip into existence, seemingly out of nowhere. Impulse drives are very fast, and are probably mostly used for intra-system travel, interplanetary stuff, and here we see a reason why it may be rare for liches to appear on the front lines. They are heckin' big chonkers, sorry I just said that. At their size, they would be far too large to fit in the hangars we've seen of the CCS-class cruisers, and they definitely aren't fitting in a damn CRS-class light cruiser, no way. They'd have to be loaded somewhere into an actual assault carrier to be brought along, but that's a lot of space where you could instead bring three Kezkatu pattern phantoms. Any would do, but those are my favorite, and they're the most advanced. And at that point, three phantoms can carry up to 75 troops at a time, making a lich somewhat inefficient. However, liches do appear in Halo 4, a whole lot of them, and the fleet that arrived at Requiem first appears to consist entirely of CRS-class Xanar pattern light cruisers, you know, the ship's too small to store them. The Maugen patterns we see in Spartan Ops didn't show up until after, as far as we know, and those might be able to carry a lich, but we don't know. So how did they get there? Well, liches do have shielding, as I said, and they are rated for slip space 
space, and we see them piggyback through the slipspace rupture opened by the mantle's approach. That's uh, the Didact's big ship. So why wouldn't the OG Coveys do this then so they can use their liches? Well, based on what happened to In Amber Clad when she piggybacked through slipspace, that is to say her engine's cores were depleted and her weapons temporarily offline, it's safe to assume that piggybacking through a slipspace rupture has a chance to cause some amount of damage. My guess, the shipmasters and fleet masters decided bringing them along wasn't worth the risk of damage to themselves or the expended fuel, all for 40 extra troops at most. Piggybacking through a light cruiser's rupture, hang on, <laughs> I'd like somebody to piggyback through my rupture. Piggybacking through a light cruiser's rupture must have been the way they got to Requiem, however, and due to the Storm Covenant's more fanatical nature, and the fact that their tactics are entirely different to that of the OG Covenant, it's possible they just risked it out of desperation or lack of interest in doing things by the books. It's also stated that Kigyar pirates like to use these to stalk and pillage ships in orbital lanes, so you'd very likely see these alongside the Kigyar raiders and intrusion corvettes. In any case, now that the Lich has been given its time to shine against the humans post-war, we can see this so-called civilian security transport for what it is, a heavily armored airborne scarab. The secondary armament of the Lich consists entirely of Type 52 plasma cannons. Just like the ones found on scarabs and set up along Covenant battlements during the early stages of occupation. These are excellent anti-personnel weapons, but they fall very short of a shade turret for anything else. As such, the Lich relies on infantry to guard the ventral grav lift, and in my opinion they'd be better off bringing all those cannons down there to give it better cover, but hey that's just me. The primary armament of the Lich is far more interesting. A single front mounted emim pattern focus beam, aka the T-56 PEW slash M aka Scarab Laser. Focus beams are one of the smallest iterations of the famous plasma lances and energy projectors found on Covey starships, alongside hunter assault cannons and focus rifles. These things are known for melting fortifications and vehicles, and the ultra-heavy focus cannon found on the Scarab is the reason that the walker is so feared. The Lich's focus cannon was a blessing and a curse. Considered warship grade, many of the crews, that being two dudes, the pilot and the weapons officer, were nowhere near equipped to utilize it. These are essentially glorified phantom pilots given a plasma lance. Needless to say, this level of firepower is far out of proportion to this level of crew. Apparently, these powerful and energy-draining weapons served as more of an impediment than a boon during the war, but during and after the Great Schism, it augmented Sangheili fleets greatly once their general firepower had dwindled significantly. To put that more simply, once they lost the firepower and numbers of the Covenant, the Lich was much more viable. Within the Swords of Sanghelios, the Liches appear to be the exact same, the only difference being that they have this red and white coloring rather than the purple, the exception being what I think is the Arbiter's Lich, which is completely gold, making it look just like a fuel rod cannon. But enough about Sangheili. Another faction has made significant use of the ship in their own way. Thanks to the Eklan Dahl War Forges, one of the most prolific forges in service of the Banished, many Kamiro Sish pattern liches have been redesigned and repurposed to suit the Banished strategy. With so much emphasis on occupation and territory control, the Banished have turned this flawed troop carrier into a more general use heavy dropship. The Eklan Dahl Workshop Lich is still well capable of carrying large amounts of troops, and it does, but it can also deploy entire Banished outposts. This remains in line with the Banished MO and their Dreadnoughts, which I also did a breakdown on a while back click on there. It would seem that the Enduring Conviction, the former Banished flagship, that CAS-class carrier from Halo Wars 2, carried with her at least a few liches, which filled the void of a Banished Dreadnought well enough. In my opinion, based on what we see on Zeta Halo, Banished Dreadnoughts can be more efficient in setting up fortifications than like a score of, of liches, but they're certainly workable, about on par with the Spirit of Fire post-upgrades from Isabel in that regard. I still stand by my statement, however, that if a Dreadnought was on the Ark instead of the CAS-class, the Spirit of Fire would be having a much worse time. At 79.7 meters, this version of the Lich is significantly shorter than the original. Some of the movement control turbines, doors, and their shield generators have been removed, but the front has been reinforced with even more armor, be it 
titanium or steel or some kind of chrome nanolaminate plating that's never been explicitly discussed. The movement control turbines could be, and this is just my theory, this isn't stated anywhere, replaced by uh, gravitic maneuvering devices, which would be very in character for the brutes. Gravitics are the technology within Halo that allow for manipulation of gravity. So gravity hammers, the plating that allows the UNSC to walk around on their ships in space, the way that frigates hover in atmosphere. Brutes make especially prolific use of the tech, using it as a firing mechanism for their small arms, maneuvering for land vehicles, melee weaponry, bayonets on shotguns, the works. They still have their impulse drives, which is good, but its grav lift appears to be gone. Every time we see one boarded or debarked from, they use these side doors, which now reach closer to the ground due to the gutting of the bottom. It really seems to me like these banished liches were built for carrying occupation equipment and fortifications rather than troops especially in lieu of a dreadnought. The Lich's focus beam of course still sees use, but with its less emphasized role as a troop carrier, it seems like the Type 52 plasma cannons have been employed elsewhere, as I recommended. Pavium's Lich Vanguard tactic is a very effective one. After opening a portal to send troops through, a Lich circles overhead and provides some area denial to enemies, so the infantry aren't swamped with human gunfire as soon as they come through. Far superior to the Covey Remnant's usage if I do say so. So known liches, well aside from the mass deployments we've talked about, i.e. the ones at Requiem, the ones on Sanghelios, the ones at the Ark, there are some liches we know the names of. Upright Chalice was a lich that served as a part of the Fleet of Particular Justice, and if that sounds familiar, it's the fleet that destroyed Reach and followed the Pillar of Autumn to Installation 04. We see it do what a lich does, deploy from the Covenant Destroyer Blameless Conceit, set some troops down and go back into orbit. Those troops would participate in the assault on Alpha Base, which was a battle that happened in between missions during Halo Combat Evolved. I would love to see a Halo Combat Evolved Evolved that has an extra mission where you defend Alpha Base alongside Fireteam Raven. Think about it, the ending scene where Cortana talks about how many people they killed would be a lot more impactful if we get to see all the people she's talking about, aside from the couple dozen marines we meet along the way. What we had to do, for Earth, an entire Covenant Armada obliterated and the Flood, we had no choice. Pleasure serving with you. It's up to you now, Chief. You're all that's left. If you don't know anything about Alpha Base or what I'm talking about, Halo Cannon did a video on the full timeline of the Battle of Installation 04, which you can see in the top right. Anyway, that's all we see of Upright Chalice. This is the actual model that is listed as Upright Chalice, by the way. Sundered Psalm is a lich under the employ of the mercenary group the Shields of Requiem. Now, <laughs> there is only one depiction of these guys, and uh, they are considered canon. Brace yourself. This mercenary lance is renowned for their combat prowess and fought under Jul Emdama during the Battle of Requiem and the Requiem Campaign. But after the Battle of Sunayan and the death of Jul, they now operate out of Sundered Psalm entirely, taking work from any Covey Remnant group that will have them. They are nearly all-inclusive, it seems, employing anyone but Jul Hane to their ranks. Okay, moving on. Is there a Lego Lich set? Hang on. There isn't. Someone did make a lich, though. Only one Eklondal workshop lich is ever named, and it is a prestigious one indeed. Pagoras serves as Atriox's personal lich. During the Second Battle of the Ark, Atriox used it as his primary mode of transportation. When Voridus unleashed the Flood upon the Ark, he and Pavium would defeat the proto-gravemind that was born of that infection, after which Atriox arrived and intimidated me through the screen. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just let him. I told you not to go. Inside. For good reason. Secure the breach. Clean up your mess. I will be waiting for you when you are done.
Well, don't look at me. Pagoras would go on to be the vessel Atriox uses to return to the galaxy from the Ark. Utilizing the portal opened by Escherum on Reach, which is a whole other story, Atriox returned and was face to face with the keepers of the One Freedom and their leader, Castor, who is a whole other story. Castor was still a devout believer in the Great Journey and intended to go to the Ark and activate the rings or die trying. Atriox and Escherum decided they weren't worth the effort and just let Castor have the Lich, knowing full well there were still thousands of banished on the installation led by Let Valir and UNSC forces nearby. They had no faith that the Keepers of the One Freedom would be able to get there. Not to mention that the activation of the portal would surely draw the attention of the Apparition, their digital overlord, Cortana. So Atriox left with his Exodus guards and Escherum, who departed with some choice words for Castor. Pray Atriox punishes your defiance now. If we ever meet again, I will peel the flesh from your bones with my own hands. How was that? Was that a good Escherum voice? And so Castor and his keepers, including a few humans, boarded Pagoras and made their way through the portal. Four of those humans are actually not strangers to us, the deep, deep undercover Veda Lopez, Mark Ash, and Olivia of Gamma Company. They had been a part of the keepers for a while now. Anyway, the Lich makes its way through the portal and once it does, they see a bright light at the end of the slipstream they're in. Now, for a little lesson on slipspace travel. The point in time that a slipspace rupture will open on the other side is set in place the moment that the rupture is open. Opened. It could be a month after, a week, or in the case of the mantle's approach, a couple minutes. So while time passes normally both inside the ship and outside of slipspace, the exit point will never change. Looking forward, the occupants of Pagoras saw a huge plasma blast headed straight for them, paused in time, awaiting their arrival. More accurately, they had already arrived. The universe just hadn't realized it yet. The perspective shifts at this point in the book to Veda Lopez on the lower deck, so we don't see exactly what happens, but it's implied that once the Lich emerged from the portal, it dove and avoided the plasma blast, only to collide midair with a B-65 short sword from the Spirit of Fire's complement. The Clan of Long Shields, led by Pavium and Voridus, these guys again, were ordered to investigate the crash site, which at the time was being attacked by a pack of Kraladonk, a carnivorous fauna native to the Ark. This story is f nuts. Anyway, the occupants of the Lich would be saved by the Covenant Remnant group led by Das Bas Vod on the Ark. Just crazy stuff happening left and right on the Ark at this point in time. But that marks the end of Pigoras' journey. There were several unnamed Liches we see throughout some comics and books, one of which was commanded by Vadagajat's mercenary group. That guy's got a fun name, Vadagajat. It was destroyed when Palmer filled her helmet with grenades and threw it up the gravity well. Really, Luke Skywalkered those guys. Rest in peace, Sarah Palmer's helmet. You were sick. You should have been worn more often often on the battlefield. A bunch of poor Kigyar pirates orbiting a planet called Ven-3 tried to <laughs> beat the Infinity with a suitor-patterned corvette and a bunch of liches and phantoms. Again, whole other story. A lich deployed fireteam Osiris and the Arbiter to Sunion, a city on Sanghelios occupied by Jules forces at the time. A lich was taken down by fireteam Crimson during the Requiem campaign in much the same fashion as the most famous lich, that being the one destroyed by Master Chief during the Battle of Requiem. Several dozen liches escorted the Didact to Ivanov Station, one of which had the pleasure of being one of Master Chief's lesser known but very impressive feats of strength. Off-screen, Chief would board this lich and kill all of its occupants, afterwards hijacking it and putting Cortana behind the controls, which was a mistake. During another one of her patented Halo 4 mental breakdowns, she would crash it, and I'm gonna play something here. It's a, another slight tangent, but it's just one of the best cutscenes in all of Halo, in my opinion. Do you know what that condescending bitch said to me after our first game of chess? Cortana. Even I don't call it by name anymore. Correct your approach. Yes, well, he also said he works better alone. I can see why you chose him, Catherine. Cortana. I'm your greatest achievement, and you detest Pull up. Now! Cortana said, bitch. Cortana. Watch your language at the dinner table. And that's pretty much every lich we've seen. Strengths and weaknesses. The lack of onboard defenses plus a grav lift turned the Lich from a formidable troop carrier to Spartan food. Unlike Phantoms and Spirits, which even Spartans usually have no way to reach as they don't need to land to deploy troops. If my theories on why they weren't used as much is true, their prohibitive size could have prevented them from being brought into battle, making all that armor and the huge laser a bit useless. But if other Covey ships would employ something like the UNSC's Pelican docking clamps, that could solve the issue. The Lich needs infantry to guard the lift, but they would need less 
infantry if they used underside plasma cannons like the Kiskatu Phantom. All Phantoms have underside cannons, but the Kiskatu has three. Those would increase lich viability by orders of magnitude, and you wouldn't need to angle the thing just so your gunners can shoot these tiny little things down on the enemy, which are a fraction as effective as Phantom guns. Another thing, these dropships are huge, and they're already used for ship-to-ship -ship naval combat, so why not give them some of the guns found on the Urshwupa gunboat Phantom? The lich is 50 meters longer than the gunboat Phantom, and yet the gunboat has a super heavy plasma cannon, a medium plasma cannon, and five fought pattern pulse lasers. These additions would make the lich the best dropship slash gunboat in the galaxy, easily, with its far greater armor and shielding already in place. Hey everyone, just gonna cut in here, this is Editing Mark, and I decided that I wanted to see what this would look like. Introducing the Mark the Crawler pattern lich. Additions include the three medium plasma cannons found on the Kezkatu pattern warrior transport, although you could just use heavy plasma cannons because the lich is so much bigger than that thing anyways, as well as four fought patterned pulse lasers. Now, I used them and blocked off one of these side bay doors because those are less useful on the original lich. And now with these additions, uh, the weapons officer might need a little bit of help. The Urshwupa pattern ship striker actually has five gunners, and that one has one super heavy plasma cannon, one medium plasma cannon, and five fought pattern pulse lasers. So, yeah, uh, give the weapons officer four buddies to help him out. And yeah, throw a bunch of these up there and you've got yourself a much, much better, more usable dropship. These would add some more exo-atmospheric capability to these things. I can't imagine that if it's fighting a bunch of fighters, for example, like sabers or something, uh, it wouldn't be wanting to swerve around to just hit them with the only weapon it's got, that being the big scarab laser. Obviously hit them if they're in front of you, but, you know, you, you don't have time to be angling that big thing. Anyway, back to uh, old Marcus from the past. What a f***ing old idiot. I love the lich. That horseshoe crab look, the deep purple of the nano laminate, the fact that the nano laminate hexagon structure is so visible, the fact that you board it like a scarab. It could use some work in-universe to be more functional, but it's also very obvious why this thing didn't go to the front line so often. I think it was probably built to one-up the phantoms that had become so ubiquitous, but with all the drawbacks I've mentioned, it was probably pulled back for work, you know, with civilian stuff, security work. I don't dislike the banished lich at all, it's just not as visually striking to me personally. It certainly fits the banished style, it just lost a lot of the smooth biological covey charm. If anyone were to slap a bunch of incinerator plasma cannons onto a lich, I would have thought it would be the banished, but I suppose having them carry battlements into the fray fits just as much. They love doing a bit of occupation. Anyways, I love this thing. Uh, please do subscribe and such. If you liked it, you may like my other videos on Covenant ships. Peace. Mark the crawler, mark the crawler, mark the crawler in the description. Go subscribe to my other channel, mark the crawler. <laughs>